Hi, I'm Sister Mary Jo Larkin. I'm one of the librarians at the Logue Library. And one of my favorite books is The Velveteen Rabbit by Marjorie Williams. Lots of people call it a children's book, but it has a very adult meaning underneath the words. I'd like to share some of them with you. There was once a velveteen rabbit, and in the beginning he was rather splendid. He was fat and bunchy as a rabbit should be. His coat was spotted brown and white, and he had thread whiskers, and his ears were lined with pink sateen. He was naturally shy, and being only made of velveteen, some of the more expensive toys snubbed him. Between them all, the poor little rabbit was made to feel himself very insignificant and commonplace, and the only person who was kind to him at all was the skin horse. Now the skin horse was wise, and he had seen a long succession of mechanical toys arrive and by and by break their mainsprings and pass away. What is real, asked a rabbit one day when they were lying side by side in the nursery. Does it mean that you have things inside that buzz inside of you and stick out? Real isn't how you're made, said the skin horse. When a child loves you for a really long time, not just to play with, but really loves you, then you become real. Does it hurt? asked the rabbit. Sometimes, said the skin horse, when you're real, you don't mind being hurt. Does it happen all at once, like being wound up, or bit by bit? Oh, it doesn't happen all at once. You become. It takes a long time. That's why it doesn't often happen to people who break easily, or who have sharp edges. And by the time you're real, most of your hair has been loved off and your eyes drop out and you get loose in the joints and very shabby. But those things don't matter at all because once you are real, you can't be ugly except for the, to the people who can't understand. Weeks passed and the little rabbit grew very old and shabby, but the boy loved him. He loved him so hard that he loved all his whiskers off and the pink lining in his ears turned gray and his brown spots faded. He even began to lose his shape and he scarcely looked like a rabbit anymore, except to the boy. He didn't mind how he looked to other people though, because the nursery magic had made him real. And when you are real, shabbiness doesn't matter. My name is Jackie Plessy. I'm the Systems Management Librarian at Log Library. And my book that's my favorite at this time is Finding Atticus by Tom Wright. And here is a picture of Tom with his little Atticus dog. And I'm going to show you a picture of Atticus before I start reading my insert. How's that for a face? It's a great read. It talks about friendship, forgiveness, and it says, 40 foot high peaks, one little dog, and an extraordinary friendship. I'm reading chapter 15. It starts with, Thank You, Friend. Robert Frost wrote, I have never started a poem yet whose end I knew. Writing a poem is discovering. I could say the same for our quest, or for that matter, any quest. I knew from the beginning that hiking 96 peaks in 90 days was a long shot, and it would be an even longer shot because I would not endanger Atticus for bringing him above tree line except on the best of days. Throughout the winter there were days I was sure we would finish and others when I thought it was a lost cause. There were nights when I was frightened or lonely, days or when I thought I had undertaken something far behind beyond my reach. We ended December with 14 peaks, January with another 24, and February with additional 27. Then came March, typically the most moderate of winter months, but this was not this year. We entered the last eight days needing to finish four hikes to reach all 96 peaks, and I was confident about our chances. Fortunately, it was snowing in the mountains again. We waited for the weather to let up waited for a day when Atticus would be safe. Slowly agonizing, the days trickled by, one after another, in which we couldn't hike. I received emails from a couple of hikers who had followed our progress, suggesting I leave Atticus behind and do the last four hikes on my own, or force him into the weather with me. I considered neither. This was our journey, and we either succeeded or failed together. In the end, we will never go to the peaks we need to finish. 
we were ready to hike again and we were going to do Carters and Cats, but I pulled the plug when I checked the higher summits forecast and extended forecast and realized it would be too dangerous to do a traverse that would carry us over eight peaks of the presidential range before winter ended. Our final tally was 81 mountains climbed. We set out to hike 96 peaks and we came up short. It didn't matter to me whether we finished at 81 or 86 or 88. It was not going to be 96. Having nothing more to do in the mountains, we returned to New Burry Point. The first day of spring found us walking the beach of Plum Island at low tide. It felt like the first day of spring should feel and winter was already a world away. Atticus was rocking along in the firm sand, ears flying like flags in the breeze. If I had known him better, I thought he was preparing for liftoff. And if I expected to look up and see him soaring with the gulls at any time, I didn't see him in the way quite some time. Over the previous three months, his gait had been strong, but steady and slow. He picked his long trails in snow and ice and rock and always conserving energy for the long haul ahead. Always a constant 20 feet in front, unless the snow was deep and needed breaking. Then he was inches behind my snowshoes. But on the beach, he opened it up, put the pedal to the metal, and ran deliriously under the warm sun. He was obvious to the waves lapping at the shore or the call of the gulls. Off in the distance, he saw a cluster of dogs and people. The dogs were milling around, almost mindlessly waiting for the humans to do something. But the people were doing something. They were attached to their cell phones and Starbucks cups, grabbing with one another. Their dogs were but nothing but our afterthought. Atticus veered towards the group, arriving several four-legged tigger bouncers as if to say, We're back! We're back! but the dogs just gave him a few half-hearted sniffs. Atticus took off sprinting down the beach and pivoted quickly and raced back towards me. Just as reaching me, he spun play for your realm and ran towards a small jetty revealed by low tide, he climbed up on the large craggy racks and leaped from one to the other, working his way to the line where sand and sea met. I followed thinking of the climb of Madison, Adams, and Jefferson. When he reached the top of the last rock, he settled his fuzzy bottom down and looked out towards the high horizon. Little Buddha was back. And this is my little introduction to the book written by Tom Riding called Following Atticus, 48 High Peaks, One Little Dog, and an Extraordinary Friendship. I chose this book because it talks about friendship, the love of a dog, and a good time reaching the mountains. Thank you. Hello, I'm Gail Cathy, Print Resources Access Services Librarian at Logue Library, and my book is Rise Up and Walk which is a first-person account of being in the hospital with polio in the 1950s. And uh, I was interested in it because my father had polio. So it is a book I found browsing on the shelves here. And I will read from the first chapter, which is called Polio is a Lonely Place. The regulation hospital bed is 34 by 74 inches. In the beginning, that much space is allotted to each polio, the new name you get after infantile paralysis slugs you. Forever after, you will be known as a polio. That 34 by 74 inch area is a place that polio meningitis allows you. And even though you have been a much traveled man in the outside world, you learn to live in it. At first, it's a very quiet life. You lie flat on your back, stretched out as far as you will go, and nothing about you moves, if you are a serious case, except the wheels inside your head. Those wheels grind out a terrible pressure of fear, pain, and loneliness. Very suddenly, you have been yanked out of the relaxed, marvelous, commonplace world and set down in a tiny, flat, white jail. Polio is always so unexpected. Your hospital, the hospital for special surgery, is a fine one, 
It stands between 1st and 2nd Avenues on 42nd Street in Manhattan and on the shore of the East River just a block away, big things are happening. The cornerstone of the permanent United Nations headquarters is being laid by a number of very important men. You painfully twist your head upon the inch high pillow and a square foot of blue sky is visible through the window top. You stare at this, listening to the oratorial voice of one of the Earth's great men, which seems to come from it. The public address system of the United Nations has been tuned very loud, a surprising sort of boldness. The voice is impassioned and heavy with the weight of self-conscious statesmanship. You examine your patch of blue sky and are remarkably unimpressed. This world, which is discussed so foolishly is a million miles away. There is a rumor running swift as ground lightning through the ward that President Truman will come directly from the dedication ceremonies to see the polios in your hospital, to call upon you, to drop in for a friendly man-to-man -man chat, that the information makes you smile, you see a kind of humor in it. And you are not disappointed when the president goes directly to the mayor's house instead. There used to be a president who knew something about polio, but he is no longer with us. Your left big toe has gone numb again, and this is truly important. You yank a cord to turn on a signal light in the corridor. You storm with impatience for 30 seconds, and then as suddenly you are ashamed enough to weep. You cannot move to bring aid to your big toe, and this is a defeat overwhelming in its humiliation. Your total life has narrowed to the dimensions of your bed. You watch the blue fade from your patch of sky and long for hunger because you know the supper hour is upon you. But in the beginning, appetite is not allowed a polio. He is packed too full of pain and fear. If he disturbs himself with so much as a deep breath, his whole body pushes in rage against his throat. Your hospital bed is the only place, your only place in the world, and polio's first stages, you resent all advances across its borders. Any handling of your useless body enrages you. Your loneliness is all you have, and you can force some strange small satisfactions from it if you are not bothered. By the time the visitors begin to arrive, there is a darkness all around, and a nurse lights the reading lamp, which twists out on a limber neck from the headboard of your bed. The groans of a patient in the nearest bed are entirely understandable and soothing as well. Another country is heard from, a country in which you would not be a stranger. Your heart does not ache for the torture of this other bed clasp life. Your heart has melted through your own unmoving body and its pity will not reach elsewhere. You begin to force up your courage to meet your wife's eyes. You hear her quick footsteps. Her watchful face moves towards you like a smooth full pressure of love. And by the wetness of your cheeks, you know that you are crying. That's what polio is like in the beginning, right after it hits you like a hammer in the head. Hi, I'm Hillary Hunter, the Technical Services and Information Literacy Librarian at Loke Library. And today we're talking about our favorite books. So mine is The Alchemist. It's by Paulo Coelho. I also wrote my senior thesis on this book, so it's very special to me. Um, so I'll get started with a little passage from it. I'm the king of Salem, the old man had said. Why would a king be talking with a shepherd, the boy asked, awed and embarrassed? For several reasons, but let's say that the most important is that you have succeeded in discovering your personal legend. The boy didn't know what a personal legend was. It's what you have always wanted to accomplish. Everyone, when they are young, knows what their personal legend is. And at that point in their lives, everything is clear and everything is possible. They are not afraid to dream and to yearn for everything that they would like to see happen to them in their lives. But as time passes, a mysterious force begins to convince them that it will be impossible for them to realize their personal legend. 
None of what the old man was saying made much sense to the boy, but he wanted to know what the mysterious, what the mysterious force was. The merchant's daughter would be impressed when he told her about that. It's a force that appears to be negative, but actually shows you how to realize your personal legend. It prepares your spirit and your will, because there is one great truth on this planet. Whoever you are, or whatever it is that you do, you, when you really want something, it's because that desire originated in the soul of the universe. It's your mission on Earth. Even when all you want to do is travel, or marry the daughter of a textile merchant? Yes, or even search for, tre for treasure. The soul of the world is nourished by people's happiness, and also by unhappiness, envy, and jealousy. To realize one's personal legend is a person's only real obligation. All things are one. And when you want something, all the universe conspires in helping you to achieve it. They were both silent for a time, observing the plaza and the townspeople. It was the old man who spoke first. Why do you tend a flock of sheep? Because I like to travel. The old man pointed to a baker standing in his shop window at one corner of the plaza. When he was a child, that man wanted to travel too, but he decided first to buy his bakery and put some money aside. When he's an old man, he's going to spend a month in Africa. He never real realized that people are capable at any time in their lives of doing what they dream of. He should have decided to become a shepherd, the boy said. Well, he thought about that, the old man said. But bakers are more important to people than shepherds. Bakers have homes, while shepherds sleep out in the open. Parents would rather see their children marry bakers than shepherds. The boy felt a pang in his heart, thinking of the merchant's daughter. There was surely a baker in her town. The old man continued. In the long run, what people think about shepherds and bakers becomes more important for them than their own personal legends. The old man leafed through the book and fell to reading a page he came to. The boy waited and then interrupted the old man just as he himself had been interrupted. Why are you telling me all this? Because you are trying to realize your personal legend, and you are at the point where you are about to give it all up, and that's when you always appear on the scene? Not always in this way, but I appear in one form or another. Sometimes I appear in the form of the solution, or a good idea. At other times, at a crucial moment, I make it easier for things to happen. There are other things I do too, but most of the time people don't realize I've done them. The old man related that the week before, he had been forced to appear before a miner and had taken the form of a stone. The miner had abandoned everything to go mining for emeralds. For five years he had been working as a at a certain river and had examined hundreds of thousands of stones looking for an emerald. The miner was about to give it all up, right at the point when, if he were to examine just one more stone, just one more, he would find his emerald. Since the miner had sacrificed everything to his personal legend, the old man decided to become involved. He transformed himself into a stone that rolled up to the miner's foot. The miner, with all the anger and frustration of his five fruitless years, picked up the stone and threw it aside. But he had thrown it with such force that it broke the stone, it fell upon, and there, embedded in the broken stone, was the most beautiful emerald in the world. People learn early in their lives what is their reason for being, said the old man, with a certain bitterness. Maybe that's why they give up on it so early, too. But that's the way it is. The boy reminded the old man that he had said something about the hidden treasure. Treasure is uncovered by the force of flowing water, and it is buried by the same currents. If you want to learn about your own treasure, you will have to give me one-tenth of your flock. What about one-tenth of my treasure? The old man looked disappointed. If you start out promising what you don't even have yet, you'll lose your desire to work toward getting it. The boy told him that he had already promised to give one-tenth of his treasure to the gypsy. Gypsies are experts at getting people to do that, sighed the old man. In any case, it's good that you've learned that everything in life has its price. This is what the warriors of light tried to reach. The old man returned the book to the boy. Tomorrow, at this same time, bring me a tenth of your flock, and I will show you how to find the hidden treasure. Good afternoon. And he vanished around the corner of the plaza. And that's that. <laughs>